right, cool. Um, welcome to SOE Live. This is the second episode of our test show where we interview local entrepreneurs. Um, today, it's super awesome. We have Rick from Whole Bean Coffee Company um, in Harrisonburg. He's a brand new entrepreneur to the world. Um, he, he's, been, he's been in um, public school education for the last, you said 10 years? 15. 15 years. And now he's tested his hand at the entrepreneurship world. So can you just give us a little bit of background on the kind of venture you're going for? Sure. Um, you know, and I guess there's a different, different, couple different aspects that I could kind of approach it on. Um, talking about the, vent, the specific venture itself right now is starting a coffee bar. And, but the overall big picture of this venture is, is something that we've kind of backed into. We've backed into business and creating a business structure and a business model. And um, it all started with our relationships first, these existing relationships that I've, we've been cultivating over the last 10, 15 years, unaware that it would be for business or economic uh, ventures, uh, anything that would be this mutually beneficial relationship that we're building with an economic kind of slant to it. Right. Um, so the coffee bar is going to be moving into um, the Rock and Wolf Food Truck Park, which is off of Wolf Street, 120 West Wolf Street, which is sort of a new venture with some small food trucks and property owners. And they're creating this new environment for uh, a central sort of food truck location. Uh, we have one food truck court uh, right now um, that's in Harrisonburg, that is. Harrisonburg has one food truck court on south on Route 42. And, but this food oh, truck please. park will be um, close to downtown. And so Grilled Cheese Mania, for example, that's out there is here as well. Their second location is at our food truck park. And Berlin's Thrill of the Grill, just amazing steak, chicken steak, and also culturally influenced uh, sub sandwiches, hot sub sandwiches, uh, with some great recipes. Berlin has a background in um, culinary school, and, and, other, and he wanted to bring all that to a food truck. And so he's also the property manager for this, uh, our food truck park. And we have a, a brewery that's moving in out of Virginia Beach into um, the building on the food truck park. So we ourselves, we're not a food truck. Uh, the Whole Bean Coffee Company will not be a, a mobile coffee truck like the new Starbucks truck that's on JMU campus. Um, we will be a brick and mortar location. So on that property is an old garage slash car wash. So there's a two bay, large two bay high ceiling garage, which the brewery will move into. And then there's three single bays, which were uh, single bay car wash uh, bays. And we're moving into one of those, which is a perfect amount of space for us. Um, the, the way that um, we've kind of backed into this is working with small coffee farmers. So small is a sort of a consistent theme in the way that we're starting this business and want to see it grow. Um, in coffee and a lot of other businesses, small seems to be a very big emphasis. Get really good at one really great thing is what uh, a lot of people are talking about, and it fits who we are so well. So we want to be really great at coffee. And, and a big aspect of being really great at coffee, we're finding, um, is, is the relationships. Coffee is a multi-billion dollar industry in, in the world, um, with North America and Western Europe sort of being the main uh, money generators of that business. 90% um, of the profits of coffee stay, uh, come, stay here in the first world in uh, the US and North America, and only 10% go back to the coffee farming communities and the coffee farmers themselves. Um, there are so many middlemen in coffee that each, there's all these sub-businesses under coffee that are multi-million dollar industries. Um, sourcing coffee, well, growing coffee, sourcing coffee, processing coffee in the native countries where it's grown, um, shipping coffee, roasting coffee, packaging coffee, and brewing coffee at a coffee bar. Each of those are their own multi-million dollar industries. Um, and so our goal is if we stay small, build small, stay within a, a, a single community, um, we believe that we can build an economic model where we cut out more of the middlemen to benefit the coffee farmers and the, in the uh, of origin of this coffee. So we're a little radical in the way we want to do this. Now, I was giving you the 90-10 equation. We, want to, we envision a 50-50 equation. Or because the profit margin is so high in coffee, with uh, especially the way we're doing it, because we're not only are we going to be brewing coffee at a coffee bar, but we're package, we're getting our beans. We have these beans, and I'll share the story of how we got these beans yeah. too. But we have these uh, uh, raw coffee beans, high quality coffee beans that we're getting roasted in small batches on a weekly basis by a local roaster, Troy Lucas, uh, who runs Lucas Roasting Company in Broadway, Virginia. 
And he's an expert roaster and does a terrific job on these beans and really brings out the intended flavor that the coffee farmer had. So um, the, far, the coffee that we use is Cinco Tucanes coffee. And Cinco Tucanes, which it's a Spanish uh, name, which means five toucans. So my friend, who I went to college with, who was originally from Harrisonburg, uh, well, he was born elsewhere, but raised here in Harrisonburg, and uh, graduated from Harrisonburg High School and graduated from Eastern Mennonite University, where we met in college. He, um, after he graduated, moved to Nicaragua to work with the Mennonite Church in sustainable agriculture, uh, peace building, um, mediation, community building, peace and justice issues. While down there, during that time, uh, 12 years ago, met a woman, fell in love, got married, and um, wanted to be a farmer. He, his roots, his family's roots are in farming. So he bought a farm um, in, not, Nicaragua. in Nicaragua with his wife, wow. not knowing it was a coffee farm at first, until his neighbors told him, and until he went to first clear and clean up his property, is these beautiful coffee plants that had long been sitting uncared for. Um, so and he picked a piece of land and bought it. Yes, okay. yes, yes, that's right. Um, and not knowing anything about coffee, really, in the coffee okay. business. Okay. Um, so was this? this was about six years ago. Okay. So six years ago is when he bought the coffee farm. It's a small farm. It's a 20, 25 acre farm. And he grows coffee in about 10 acres of it. Okay. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. So you said that you found that working in such a small, um, a small community relationships has been incredibly important to you. Can you like kind of talk about how you personally have worked to build relationships and like any tips and tricks that you have in building relationships? Um, well, you know, and, and it's it's uh, that's a great question, and I like the way you phrase it because I want to point out how I don't like the way you phrased it. Um, it cool. You know, the tips and tricks about building relationships is is a misnomer. You know, it's. It's uh, the wrong way to think about building relationships. You know, it's, it's uh, relationships is the sincere, the most sincere aspect of the human experience. You know, building connections with other human beings, which I believe is it was one of the main purposes of our existence on this planet, is building connections with others. We see the humanity and the power and the depth and the beauty of each human being, and we see the existence of something beyond humanity, a higher power, God, whatever you want to want to call it. We see that in others and, and who we are, and our connection with them brings that out and create something bigger than what we could ever achieve on our own. Um, so building relationship has been a main um, way that fits who I am, but also builds bridges to break down walls between people that we've built up because of our perceived differences. Mm -hmm. I believe that differences can be a way to draw people together, uh, whereas most of us are uh, afraid and put off by differences. Most of us are drawn to people who are like us. That's human nature. But I, um, and the, a lot of the work that I've done uh, through the education system and through community organizing groups has been to help motivate people and encourage people to be drawn to each other based on differences as much as we're drawn to each other based on similarities. Wow, you're different than I am. You have a different way of looking at that than I do. Right. That's fascinating. Tell me more about that. That's the kind of energy that I think that, um, that we need more of. And that's the kind of same kind of energy that I want to and need to bring to this business model. Right. Well, if it weren't for the relationships, I would not be a, a coffee businessman. I'm not a businessman. I'm not a coffee guy. <laughs> I'm a relationship builder. I, I make connections and build connections. But I know a lot of great people who are business minded and are excited about some of these ideas. The and have, that the and, minded. Exactly. Yeah. And it's because of the difference that there's a strength in this idea and right. this plan that can actually make money. So you started like about a year ago, you said. And yes. What, what was the process like of learning an industry and, and putting together a business plan for an industry in just yeah. a year? So it's a similar kind of uh, mindset I was tell talking to you about. It's my friend is a coffee farmer. I thought that was pretty damn cool. Yeah. And I wanted to try his coffee. So I said, hey, let me, I'll buy a bag off of you. And I loved it. It was, it was like the smoothest and the most full-bodied smooth coffee I'd ever tasted. And I got hooked. And I was telling my coworkers about it. I was telling my principal at my school about it. And they're like, oh, that sounds cool. I want to buy that. Um, so I started bringing them bags. And then they started telling others. And there was repeat buyers. And I doubled his sales within the first month. And I tripled his sales in the next month. And just by word of mouth, direct connections. And then I started talking to strangers about great coffee that I had. And it, was just, it just became something exciting. Um, I feel like I have natural sales abilities, but I hate sales. But finally, I was excited about a product. I was excited about something that I enjoyed, but also it benefited my friend. Yeah. And it just, uh, for some reason, this energy came from somewhere to talk about his coffee. And so I ended up talking about his coffee. Maybe it came from the coffee. 
Yeah. Maybe the coffee itself. It's a caffeine-fueled sales energy. Yeah, that's a great idea for uh, yeah, marketing teams and sales teams. Just fuel them up on caffeine. Right. Yeah. And, um, and, and so one of the places I sold it to was the Bowl of Good Cafe, which they have two locations, one on, um, on Mount Clinton Pike and one on Port Road. Right. And the Port Road location wasn't doing as well. Um, the Mount Clinton Pike had its community there and its following and a lot of loyal customers. And it was still new to, this, to the Port Republic side of town, uh, JMU side of town, let's right. say. And they asked us, hey, you think you could maybe want to work with us, develop something with coffee? We think that could increase our sales, increase our sales among JMU students, JMU professors, and people who live in this side of town. And I was like, uh, we were like, I don't know. We've never done that before. Let's, let's talk about it. And so we were trying to build a business plan and a model that would make sense for who we were and wouldn't involve too much overhead. And, and really, in a, being in an existing location, that already has its customer base, that already has its marketing base, it, it required very little overhead for us. So we were, we, we were open to it. Um, it was never, it's ne it never has been my dream, as I'm opening a coffee bar, it's never been my dream to start a coffee bar. Um, but the, um, the existence of the coffee bar will be a terrific vehicle for the other things we're hoping to do. Creating an economic vehicle for my friend's coffee and other small coffee farmers' coffee um, who have a direct connection to Harris and And that's another, I mean, this experience for me has been a serendipitous connection after serendipitous connection. And these doors opening by themselves, you know, you ever walk to a building where they have the automatic door, you don't have to push on it, it's like, phew, opens. Like, that's exactly how this experience has been. And a lot of these connections um, I couldn't ignore. And a lot of these opportunities I couldn't ignore, and it's the reason why I'm moving forward on, on starting a business that I otherwise may not have. So are you going full time on the coffee business? Um, no, I am not. Um, and um, I, I'm a youth worker by vocation. Right. It's my calling in life to work with young people. I've been doing that for the last 20 years um, in a number of capacities and very, I feel very successfully. And I've been able to, and it's kind of almost my own side business in and of itself. Right. Um, and I want to continue to do that. And I need a stable steady income. Um, I don't quite know what's going to come of this. There could be the opportunity where I would leave my position at the city schools if this continues to be bigger than what I imagined and could sustain a, a full-time position for myself, which would be similar to matching the salary I have now after 20 years of work in a public school system. Right. Um, that's a possibility. Um, so I'm not close to that, but it's not part of the plan currently. So that's kind of a great like, situation that a lot of us have is that we're, like, we're full-time students, we have all these other jobs on campus, Absolutely. and we really want to start a company. And so how have you found that your like, time management, has right. that been a big, big part of building this company? Is like really f finding your priorities or? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, um, I love my day job and I want to do a good job and I want to keep my job. <laughs> so it is it's very important for me to focus on that when I'm there, right. um, because it's a pretty demanding job in terms of my attention, and my energy, uh, and my skill set. Um, but it's hard to not want to work on uh, my business while I'm there yeah. uh, and make connections and update my Twitter page and my Facebook page and connect that to you know, uh, other companies and other organizations that are doing the same thing and look, look up other opportunities for zero interest business loans and right. you know all, this, all those kind of things. It's, it's really tempting not to, but I, I have to discipline myself. I have to be better at disciplining myself with that because it's, it can be really overwhelming. Well, you're um, so excited about ideas. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, my job is, is demanding as it is that I don't, I can't afford to add planning for a, uh, a new company right. on top of that. So I have to um, schedule my time. So what, I do, what I've now done in my, in my calendar is Outside my work hours, I write prepare dinner time, I write work on business time, I write um, sports time, I write time with my children time. I mean, just I build in all those different aspects into my schedule because um, I'm not I'm um, a very uh, on the off the hip kind of person. I'm very spontaneous, outgoing, gregarious, and it, and it's easy for me to to not want to be structured. I, right. I hate structure. I resist structure, <laughs> um, but I'm finding I'm getting very overwhelmed. Um, when I don't structure my time better. So are you the only partner of uh, Whole Bean Coffee? So I, I will be, it's an LLC right now, okay. and I'll, I'm the sole kind of uh, proprietor in that. Um, I mean, that's two different terms, but right. so I'm the only guy, the only partner in, the, in this LLC um, with, the op with the possibility of other people who are interested. Um, for now, for simplicity purposes, we're getting everything started, all the applications filled out, uh, getting the bank account open, it's easier to do it just in my name. 
as opposed to trying to run around with a full-time job to catch everyone to get them to sign this, sign that, and get it over to where it needs to go. Right. Um, so it's easier for, and it can always be changed in the future. One of the things that we're um, investigating and looking into is possibly changing our, cor our company type to a B Corp, which is a new business structure for, for organizations and institutions that are in between a, a nonprofit and a for-profit company. So for-profit companies with a purpose, a meaning, and mission. And we fit that very well. So companies like Ben and Jerry's and others are That's like our B Corps. Yeah. yeah. So look, I mean, look up. I was look, reading uh, online about it yesterday, and uh, my my accountant I'm going to hire knew nothing about it. <laughs> so it's it's like super new. Wow. Uh, and there's like only 1,500 companies in the country that are, or maybe even worldwide, that are even in that category. So um, for, for those of you who are mission minded, purpose minded, right. but also um, business minded. A B Corp is an exciting new kind of opportunity that we're still investigating and see if it's going to make sense for us. On, on the surface, it looks like it fits who we are a lot better. So you weren't at, at all an entrepreneur a year ago, right? Or it wasn't, it wasn't nearly as it is now. No. How did you go about learning the, the paperwork, the terms, all that stuff? You know, that's a great question. And every time I go to a different office, um, especially if I'm at that same office, office for the third time, in the same day, right. which has happened often, I tell everyone that I talk to, you know what, I'm gonna write down everything that I've had to do in order and publish this somewhere because <laughs> this is valuable information. Yeah. And, and no one seems to know in their head, this comes first, this comes second. I found out much further down the road that I, the first person I should have been talking to was the health inspector. Mm -hmm. you know, I, didn't, I was assuming it was the, the code people, the business you know, uh, right. codes, you know, city code people. Um, to know what, uh, how my the property is coded in terms of what use I have. Um, I, I assume that's where I needed to start. And I had been in that office three, four, five times until someone said, no, you gotta go to the health department, the health inspector. Yeah, and so um, I'm, I'm learning by um, trial, the trial, trial and error, you know, trying it out. Amazingly valuable blog post. It would have been <laughs> incredible. Because yeah. I know there's a lot of people here who are just trying to take off and just find the paperwork. I know. Bittner and I talk mm -hmm. about that all the time, about how like we just don't know how to start a company. Like that's just a huge problem that is like a wall and we don't know how to crack it. Yeah. Like a lot of us aren't business students, actually most of us aren't business students. And so having mm -hmm. like having that connection to a a resource, I mean there's always like start a company for dummies, just like the book, but like even that isn't a great yeah, I mean, what's even interesting is I met with two business related attorneys who are friends of mine separately. And neither of them told me I should go to the health inspector first. Neither, neither of them knew that off the top of their head. They probably could have told me later down the road if they would ever right. started billing me by the hour, and then they would have told me. I don't know. <laughs> um, but, um, but so, I mean, for me, it's, I'm, I'm documenting everything that I do so that I can offer that to others in the future. And that's how I've always been, like learning, doing it the wrong way so that I can help others later how to do it the right way. Right. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, I want to open it up to audience questions too. We sort of forgot to introduce that earlier. Right. So for with SOE Live, this is the second time we've done it. Um, we have our SOE group here today. Um, and does anyone have any questions? Just for, and, and if you don't right now, just walk up to the front when you do. It. Yeah. Um, if there aren't any questions, I'm really interested in your market. How did you? What What do you define as this market for your coffee? So we, uh, I envision, I'm, I'm a big picture person, I'm a right. vision person, I'm a passion person, I'm not the dot the I's, cross the T's kind of person. Right. Um, and so, um, so my, my energy has been really focused on changing the way we drink coffee and enjoy coffee and share coffee in Harrisonburg. In the same way the beer guys have changed the way we drink beer and in Harrisonburg. Beers it's, and, and, and because they've been open to collaboration with each other, right. that they actually helped each other's bottom lines. Yeah. And it's clear, and it makes me excited to want to buy. Like every time I go out, I buy. I look for the local beer, for, beer first. Yeah. For, and if they don't have the ones I like that are local, then I'll go for Charlottesville area beers. Then I'll go for you know Staten or whatever. Right. You know, um, I'll start to sort of enlarge my circumference on um, my waist and the beer that I that I choose. <laughs> um, so so I believe, and I've been trying to build relationships, working very hard at it with with varying levels of success with local coffee people. They, they like my energy and they like my ideas. They see me as very green, uh, pun intended, you know, about, you know, in this whole business right. of coffee. And they see me as a little idealistic, which I don't mind at all. Yeah. And they see me as a little naive, which I don't mind at all. Some of the greatest ideas in history were seen as idealistic and naive. Right. So to me, that's not, I mean, I'm not saying I have one of the greatest ideas in history. What I'm saying is, to me, that's not something that holds me back or scares me or worries me. And I just keep working at it. 
And I've been outright rejected by some people, uh, some coffee people, and I keep going back. And now they're finally wanting to come back to the table because they see our idea moving forward. Um, so what I envision is, number one, sharing the story of the small coffee farmers. So right now, currently in Harrisonburg, our coffee, Cinco Tucanes Coffee, which is going to be the sort of the flagship coffee for my coffee business, um, is the only coffee in Harrisonburg where you know the farmer's first name. His name's Jamie, and his wife's name's Evelyn. And they live over on Shenandoah Street right now while they're getting her immigration paperwork situated so they can eventually go back to Nicaragua. So they're going to be here for at least two to three years. And they'll show up at the coffee bar. They might brew some of the coffee that you're drinking. So the coffee farmers, you know those old Juan Valdez commercials where you would open the window and hand you a cup of coffee? Right. It's actually going to be like that. You know? <laughs> it's actually going to be that. You know? I mean, they're not going to wear the you know, coffee farmer garb or anything like that. But that's, I mean, that's, that's exciting to me. That's really exciting. So it's like they're going to have pictures of what the coffee looks like in berry on their plants. Like not just coffee and berry on someone's plants. On their plants. And they may have a cutting, a clipping from one of their coffee trees there so you can see and smell the berry and see the varying colors are red and yellow and green as they ripen. I mean, they look like cherries. They call them cherries, actually, in Spanish, in Latin America. And um, so we'll, sh and we'll share their story of how the what the struggle has been for them to get their coffee to market, how many failures they've had yeah. in the process of getting their coffee from their farm to the mill, which is a 30-mile drive you know, from where they live, how their coffee's been stolen from the mill to the port, how their coffee's been switched with other lower-quality coffees. And my, my friend, in the way my friend Jamie puts it, it's just like heartbreaking. It's like, Rick, I've had so many sleepless nights um, in, this, in, the, in the process of getting my coffee to, to here, to Harrisonburg, where I you know, went to high school. You know, it's, it's disappeared, it's been, sh it's been mixed, it's been uh, processed poorly and improperly. Um, to get your coffee out of Nicaragua, um, it has to go through a very um, stringent uh, testing and evaluation. Um, and, and, and that's been new for Nicaragua because they've had a bad reputation with bad coffee going out under the name of Nicaraguan coffee. And they've really tightened that up. And so it's, it's to be able to go through that, they have to trust their coffee to someone else and it's out of their sight for a while. Um, so that's been scary for them. And learning how hard it is. Now, we believe that Jamie is going to be a trailblazer for other small coffee farms. So his farm is only 20 acres and grows t uh, coffee on 10 acres of it at 700 meters, entirely shade grown, entirely organic, hand cleared, hand picked, um, and, and, and stored in his parents' basement once it gets here. And, um, and we, and some, now because he has a foot in this world and in that world, yeah. He has an advantage yeah. of getting his own coffee here. Most small coffee farmers could never dream of doing something like that. So they have to sell their coffee to the middlemen, what I call them wolves, really. They're roaming middlemen who find where these small coffee farmers are set up. All through Latin America, all through that coffee, and all through the world, really. Right. Same, ha same is happening in Africa, the same is happening in East Asia. You know, all through that sort of coffee belt, um, it's happening to a lot of people where these roaming middlemen come and offer them pennies on the dollar for their entire crop, and it's really tempting. Like, I can sell my entire crop right now and have enough money to maybe live through the year, or I hold on to it and wait for the better price. Right. And they really don't have that bargaining chip. They don't have that leverage. Um, so we believe, and this, and this is part of the serendipity of it, you know. So I was talk, I work for the city schools, and I do a lot of interpretation and translation. So I was interpreting for one father, and this kind of started um, at the school I was working at. And I wanted to offer him a cup of my friend's coffee because I kept it there at the school. And I was like, you know, kind of showing off my friend's coffee and like, yeah, this is really quality coffee. My friend brings it. So he, he oh, I would like to try that. He drinks it and he's like, you know what? My brother owns a coffee farm in Oaxaca, Mexico. Do you think we could bring his coffee here? I was like, I, I don't know. Let's look into it. <laughs> you know, so I started asking around. I had, what would it take to do that? And it's uh, a lot more than I had imagined. A lot more than I had imagined. And then uh, on another day, I went to the high school. And they have someone who does my job at the high school. And he's originally from Columbia. And I was trying to sell my coffee to uh, my friend's coffee to him. And he says, you know what? We get all our coffee from Columbia. And actually, my dad's a coffee farmer in Columbia. You think we could get his coffee here? That's and I was like, let's sure. figure it out. I, I don't know. We're going to work together and figure this out. And then the owners of Little Italy Pizza, for example, uh, they're from El Salvador originally. And I went in there, and there's a young man there who I worked with in high school, and, and he's studying business at a community college. And oh, I said, oh, maybe you can come work for me when you graduate. I need, I need a businessman's mind. And he's like, well, what are you doing? So I started telling him. He's like, you've got to talk to my dad. So he takes me to the back, talks to his, his dad's family, has been growing and, and shipping their coffee in varying degrees already to the US, but in lower quality product, you know, mixing and blending with other uh, kinds of coffees. 
And so because the specialty coffee market is the area I want to be in. Um, Folgers is not in the specialty coffee market, although they think they are because they're using Arabica beans. Um, they're not. Um, Arabica beans are, um, are a sort of a smaller percentage of the overall market, but they're the higher quality ones that we're used to drinking now in any place we get a coffee. Uh, Robusta beans are the ones that are more widely grown. They're more robust. They sound better. Um, they sound, they're bigger, they're healthier, but they don't taste as good. They're more, a little more bitter to the taste. And they use a lot of those t for um, instant coffee. Or they, people in the third world actually drink that. It's, it, most people from the third world who grow coffee can't afford to drink their own coffee unless they keep some back and roast it at home and uh, drink it there. But most people don't. And um, so, um, so I started talking with, you know, so getting my friend's you... coffee. And then there's another parent who just inherited a coffee farm, and she's from Brazil. And her family's owned this coffee farm. She's never worked it. She doesn't know much about it. But um, she just inherited it and didn't know what to do with it. And so I started talking with her, and we're like, we're going to try to, she's going to try to actually own it, and we're going to try to get her coffee beans here to Harrisonburg, too. So the only coffee that we want to use are the coffee that has direct connections to Harrisonburg. Now, not all of this coffee is high quality. And so some of the work we'll be doing is, is being present on these coffee farms and helping them with sustainability, helping them with increasing the production uh, values of how they grow, process, and ship coffee to, Her to the, the US, the first world. So yeah, you do you find that um, there's a good market for this now because people are more buying companies for their story than just their product? Like, do, is it likely that I'm going to come into your store and want to know, OK, I'm drinking a cup of coffee that came from this really wholesome person? In, in Harrisonburg, I believe so. Yeah. I think that, um, so it's kind of twofold. I think that market is growing when there's a story attached and a connection, a personal connection to make to that. Mm -hmm. But there's also um, this, uh, a big movement in Harrisonburg growing, as you see with the farmer's market. People want to know where, what they're consuming, where it comes from. They want to know that it was uh, quality, it was cared for with quality levels. It wasn't, there's not a lot of chemicals added to it. Right. Um, I believe, and now my choices in how, what, where I buy my food, what I buy, and how I prepare it are influenced by the fact that when you add less chemicals to your food, your food is a higher quality. It tastes better, and it's healthier for your, for your body and for your family's bodies. Um, and that's a, a really big belief shared by a lot of people in Harrisonburg. And so uh, being aware of sourcing, where it's coming from, being aware of processing, how it's processed, and being aware of the ethical impact that it makes um, by local, by fresh, um, that's a huge movement. And we're um, tagging on to that. Right. You know, we're, we're going to tag along for that ride. I think millennials are totally into that idea, too. Like, I think mm -hmm. personally, like, I, we talk about that in our marketing class all the time about how, like, the, our generation is mm -hmm. just all about the story and more uh, willing to pay. So price point, where are you going to be? Have you figured that out yet? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a big conversation that we've been having, you know, and, and the idea of the millennials. Uh, we have a lot of young uh, professionals that demographic's growing in Harrisonburg. Yeah. Um, and we believe they have a higher level of disposable income. And so we're going to be appealing to them, as, uh, but, as, but also sort of bringing that ethical value and that relationship value. We believe that it can um, attribute, it can ac accommodate for an added premium to our prices. Yeah. Um, so for example, a pound of a whole bean coffee, our coffee retails at $13 for a pound, 16 ounces. So when you think about you buy a 12 ounce bag of coffee at a grocery store and you want to buy a, a higher, you know, a nice, like, you like Tully's, you like um, Starbucks, you like um, Dunkin' Donuts, whatever. Um, they, they sell 12 ounce bags in the grocery store and those are between eight and $10. And so it's kind of, it correlates. Right. But we sell 16 ounce bags. So it seems like it's more expensive, but, but we believe we can add that premium even though we have fewer middlemen. It's benefiting um, uh, a purpose, a mission, a cause. Right. So you had your hand up a little bit ago. Mm -hmm. First of which is when I see myself going to buy a cup of coffee, how am I going to know your story? You know, it's usually just an in and out kind of thing. Yes. And that's part of what we want to change. You know, yeah. so I intentionally call the location we're starting a coffee bar. And every time I hear someone say coffee shop, I kind of interrupt them. It's like, no, it's a coffee bar. Um, and you think about a bar, a regular bar, if you're old enough to go into a regular bar. Um, you go sit down at the bar and, um, and you stay a while. You don't go, oh, let me get that beer on tap to go, thank you, you know, and walk out the door. <laughs> yeah. you know? And it, there's, there's purpose and there's reason to stay. 
Um, and so, and, and so kind of how I was talking about we want to change the way we experience coffee. Um, and part of it in, is that vision for that, that people want to stay, want to be there. So there's a significant number of people who stay. There's going to be something about the atmosphere and the ambience of what we have there that people want to stay there, and they're also going to be interested. So at each of the tables, there'll be like maybe a little flip chart thing, uh, card, little flip things with information about this coffee and the pictures of the family and their little kids and helping them clear the place. Oh, it's so cute. You know, I mean, it's like all these different aspects that really like can find ways to creatively share the story. Uh, multimedia. I mean, we're right now we're working with my farmer friend and uh, a local artist to kind of design, develop this way that we want to creatively share those stories. That's not pushing it down their throat, but it's also um, uh, in bite-sized chunks that they can share. And we, we intend to slow down coffee, um, which is a different paradigm than what we're the way we're used to consuming coffee in Harrisonburg. So it's it's a little risky, but also has a potential. Um, sort of a reward, a greater reward with it. Um, so we, we know that we need to ease people in. We can't just all of a sudden change a culture overnight. So we're going to have the ability for someone to come in and get their quick coffee. And those people, yeah, maybe won't, but maybe on the cup there might be a little picture and a story about what, what that, that coffee that you're drinking. And so maybe we'll be mindful, whatever you order, the cup matches what you order so that the story is on there. Um, that source of that coffee. Actually, I just came up with that just now, just talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> See? Young entrepreneur. There you go. Yeah, write that down. Write that down. We'll be Send me a copy of this. So yeah. We'll be good. <laughs> um, yeah, I have one more question too. Sorry, I just offered you. But, uh, but um, we'll be also set up to do quick coffee. You know, I, I, I don't love, I like to take time with my coffee. I like to sit with coffee over, right. you know, with friends. I want the barista to be someone that can be really um, congenial and really uh, draw people into conversation and make people feel welcome and at ease, not feel like a pitch man or a salesman. <laughs> so not Starbucks, not like, please hurry up and get out of here so I can get to my next Let order. Get your name wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bub, you know. Um, and so I'm mean, like in talking about the millennials connected with that, you know, I'm so tempted to like just like hire a hipster barista, you know, just or I, I don't know if I can just like fake tattoos somewhere and like get the gauges, the, the, the yeah. gauges and just do that for a while. On the, but like, you know, that, that kind of appeal, we want to make people feel um, like we're doing something a little cutting edge, a little different. And you're going to taste it. You're going to taste our difference in the coffee that you're drinking, I believe, because we're taking care. We're 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 going to be our bar, to me, a barista is an artist. You know, a barista is someone who knows how to craft a great cup of coffee. I don't know how many times when I, and I'm not even trained as a barista, mind you, but, there, but I've learned so much about brewing coffee. When I make, take my time and follow the instructions and the practice that I've learned to create a great, say, a French press, how many times people have said, that is the best cup of coffee I've ever had. And I was like, dang, I haven't even trained yet. Imagine when we get trained, and that's another serendipitous connection, the training we're going to get. I'll tell you about that as well. But <laughs> go ahead. Mm -hmm. So, how do you plan on differentiating yourself from them who also consider themselves to be local? And I think it's a great cup of coffee. So, Grains of Sense is no longer at the farmer's market. Um, Tom uh, moved uh, from Stanton uh, to somewhere else in the state of Virginia. So, he's not there. They, um, there's, another there's another guy there, Monty, who um, we've gotten to know. And he may have been, we've even talked with him about um, roasting some of our coffee and, and sort of playing with that. I, I really want to have this really back and forth collegial kind of relationship with other coffee people where we have a featured roaster who not only brings some of his coffee that he's roasted, but he's roasted some of ours. What do you think of the way he's roasted our coffees? And we'll have this for a week. And then we'll have the guy from Charlottesville who roasted his own. Traeger Brothers may come up and they roasted some of our coffee too. What do you think of the way they treated our coffee? You know, or... I, I, um, because we're so small, I believe it's a great survival strategy, mm -hmm. uh, but it also fits my personality very well. Yeah, yeah it fits who I am. Um, and we have a relationship with the farmer's market. You know, you would not believe how much politics there is in small town um, business <laughs> in general, and the farmer's market's not immune from that. And so because of a history of politics that we really have nothing to do with, we're deciding uh, not to be in the farmer's market for now, even though, in my opinion, uh, our coffee fits the farmer's market model better than any other because the farmer's going to be there actually selling the coffee. You know? and there's no other coffee that, that does that. Um, and the ways that we'll differentiate ourselves is the, the farmers themselves and the families of the farmers will be present, will be there. It's the only, I mean, other places have the ability to do that, but none of them have done that yet.
So we want to do that and share those stories. So I heard that you had a great mentorship over the last couple of years. And I know a lot of us, we work with professors, we work with, um, with people, alumni in the community, and they have been great sources of mentors. But I'd love to hear personally about your own mentorship. Yeah, you know, we um, made a relationship with um, a, a guy who lives up in Winchester through um, a bowl of good. And he runs a coffee company up there. And just so happens that this guy helped start Stumptown Roasters uh, out in Portland, Oregon, which is one of the biggest uh, coffee companies in the third wave, mov third wave movement of coffee. That's kind of what it's called. <laughs> yeah. So this guy um, is really cool, really great my, you know, my, for my same generation and just really all about coffee, trained, knows every aspect of the business. He's been roasting his own coffee forever. He's a terrific barista. He judges barista competitions for Specialty Coffee Association of America. He goes to all these big events. And uh, we went up there to visit his location up in Winchester. She's shown us around, did a cupping of our coffee with how he roasted it compared to what our regular, who our regular roaster is. Um, and, and he taught us how to do a cupping. He taught us how to do this, how to do that. And then I tell him, you know, right now my plan is to get um, barista training and coffee bar uh, operation training from um, uh, Counterculture Coffee in Washington, D.C. And he's like, don't, don't worry, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't pay for that. I'll train you. I'm certified by them anyway, by the Specialty Coffee Association. I'll train you. I'll train you how to run a coffee bar. I'll train you how to be a barista. I, I won't charge you anything. Uh, okay. I mean, like, what else, what, else, what else do you say? He, I think he was excited about our energy, about our thoughtfulness and how we're approaching this, about the ethical way that we're approaching this, but, ab but uh, above all, I think our passion for what we do. My friend, my coffee farmer friend, Jamie's very passionate about his coffee. He'd be a great person to have up here, too, because he set a model for me. He's been a mentor for me in starting the business. He said, I started small. I did not move somewhere or move into a direction that I was not financially able to. So he kept his outside loans to a minimum, absolute minimum. So um, any loan he received, he received from his family. So different parts of his family helped him build what he needed as he got there and did not jump to the next step before he finished the one he was on previously. Um, and it's been a great model for me in the way we want to run this business. M minimalistic, um, small, intentional, um, ethical and craftsmanship. Uh, I want to be sort of monikers and hallmarks of what we do in every step of the way. That's really cool. Do we have any other questions? Uh, we're getting the wrap up sign. Um, but this has been the second episode of uh, SOE Live. Uh, yeah, it's really great to have you. That was an incredible story. The passion sort of just poured out of you. Thanks. You think you're going to be open? So the hope, ambitiously, you know, we want to be open sometime in November but it looks like more like into early or mid-December. Uh, right now, we're only now starting um, the build-up cool. to the location. It's a small space, so it won't take as long as a lot of other spaces, but it still will, will take some time. So patience is important for us, but we also want to time it with the cooler weather and the, and the students being around. Uh, my friend also grows cacao, which is the plant that coffee comes from on his farm, so we want to source his natural grown uh, um, organically grown cacao and make coffee uh, chocolate drinks oh as well. well. Yeah. That sounds so, good. Yeah. But anyway, so, <laughs> so look out for Whole Bean Coffee Bar yes. in Harrisonburg this winter. Um, this has been another episode of SOE Live. Thank you very much. And uh, have we don't have a sign off. Signing off. <laughs> Signing off. See you later. <laughs>